Hey, good morning, family. How's everybody doing today? Man, so good to see everybody. Wasn't that awesome? Man, what, we have like 30 kids get dedicated today, I think. And then uh, Shane said six at Brownfield, two at South. That's a good Sunday morning, man. Uh, we're duplicating from the inside out. Come on, somebody. We're going to grow a church one way or other. And so that is awesome. Uh, man, can we give a big hand to Pastor Michael Hay and thank God for the gift that Pastor Michael and Sarah, <laughs> Pastor Sarah Hay, that they are to the worship. Michael did a great job with our men's conference this week. And uh, if you were at men, if you were at Blueprint this week, give me a, good, give me a good holler right there. There we go. And those guys were on their face. They were worshiping the Lord. And we left here as better husbands and better fathers and better believers. Amen. And so I really thank Pastor Michael for what he did. He's just such a gift to the worship center. He and Sarah both. Uh, Michael does uh, that, teaches at our school. Sarah teaches at our school. Sarah was teaching growth track at first service. And so, man, the Hayes are just awesome. Their daughters serve back in Kid City. And it's just cool, man. I just, I, I just love to see that when our whole family serves together. Real quickly, can we give a big welcome to our first-time guest, South Campus, Brownfield Campus, and our overflow rooms. Thank you for being here today. We're starting a brand new series today, and it's probably the longest series that I've ever done at the Worship Center. It's going to go about nine weeks, and uh, we're going to be talking about the Beatitudes. And some scholar says there's eight Beatitudes some say uh, there's nine. I, I, I think there are nine. I don't think I'm smarter than they are or by anything. I just think I have a different opinion than they do. Uh, but this is the most famous uh, message that Jesus ever preached, which is the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew 5, 6, and 7, all three of those chapters, if you ever want to read it. But at the beginning of that, he gives nine truths to kind of set it in motion. And I want to warn you that this series is going to be very, very challenging for everybody. And here's why. It is completely counterculture to what's going on in our society right now. And anytime you go against our society, man, you get all kinds of, I'll get all, I promise you, Pastor Todd's going to get hate email and all kinds of things. So if you want to email me hatefully, send that to Shane at TWCLubbock. <laughs> Dot com, and I'll get it first right there to get to me right off the bat. But uh, seriously, people get upset about it because, man, and I think in this world, it's more hateful than it's ever been. I don't think I've ever seen a world that has been as ugly and as nasty And because we can't even disagree with anybody anymore. We have to hate them if we just have a different mindset. And that's just insanity to me that we would have that mindset. But I think people are more miserable than ever before. And we're looking for the government and the law to change things. But I believe that the gospel is the only thing that can change our heart. Hey, will you agree with that? And I believe that we need revival in our land, and I think it has to start in our churches and in our lives before we can take it anywhere else. And so I haven't preached on this subject in about 15 or 20 years, and it is amazing to me of how different I see this now than when I preached it 15 or 20 years ago. And I am so thankful for the grace of God. When I started the worship center, I was 26 years old. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, man, you don't look a day over 30. And, and y'all are right. Um, but there were things I preached at 26 years old that I would never preach at 54 years old. And I'm so thankful that we didn't have social media. Come on, somebody. I'd have got ran out of town. And so I'm thankful for the grace of the Lord. But here we are. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 says this. Now, when the crowd saw or when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. 
Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So what I'm asking you to do for the next eight weeks is not just to come to church, but to allow the Holy Spirit to do a work in our hearts, not to make room for a pastor, not to make room for a church, but for the truth of God's word and to let it impact us in a powerful way. Jesus embodied every one of these attributes and he never intended it uh, for us to be a model for us so that we could just sit around and talk about what he did, but that we could became or become what he was and take on his likeness. Second Corinthians 2 says that we transform little by little, glory to glory, into the likeness of Jesus. So let's invite the values of the Beatitudes to come and live on the inside of us, and I believe that that is the hope for revival and a hope for a land to be changed when the church begins to live out all the attributes that Jesus did. Can somebody say amen with me this morning? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you already here. You might as well enjoy it. Now look at your second choice because you left somebody out. and say, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I love you too. Pay attention. Here we go. Now there are two things that I want you to see about the Beatitudes uh, before we get into the first one. And here's what I want you to notice right off the bat. Number one, these statements reveal where true happiness can be found. All nine of these begin with the word blessed or blessed. Blessed is the Greek is a, is a difficult word to, to, word to translate in English. It's makarios. And the Greek, in the, in the Greek it's makarios. And a lot of translators translate, translate that as blessed or happy. But it's not blessed as in you have a ton of things. It's, it's not happy as you're happy. It literally means that there's an internal joy that the world cannot give you and things cannot give you. That you're, you are completely different and circumstances can't knock you off of whatever's going on. In fact, the word happiness comes from the Latin word hap, which is where you get the word happenings. And it, it means you're happy when the happenings are going like you want them to be. You're happy when the circumstances are right. You're happy when the sun shines and you're not so happy when it doesn't. You're happy when you have money and you're not so much happy when you don't have it. You're, you're happy when your football team wins. Come on, somebody. You're happy and you're not so happy when they lose when they're supposed to win. But, but that's what happens when your happiness comes and goes with our circumstances but that's not how it should be for the people of God. The people of God are supposed to have something so deep on the inside of us that regardless of what's happening around us or what's happening to us, those circumstances, we have an eternal joy of the Lord. And Jesus said that kind of joy is found in the most unlikely places. You wouldn't think for, to look for it there. So we're going to study nine places we need to develop in, and again, this is counterculture. I realize that, but listen, we are aliens. Come on. This is not our home. We are just passing through, but if you begin to walk in these things, nothing can take your joy away because these statements reveal where true happiness can be find, found. Here's the second thing. I want you to notice how these statements end. The statements show the potential of what can be ours. They all end with they or theirs. And too many people only know a part of what Jesus came to offer. If you ask most people, what is the gospel? They would say, well, Jesus came and died on a cross to save me from my sins, which is true, but it's not complete. Jesus didn't just come to save you from your sins. He came to heal your marriage. He came to restore your heart. He came to heal your pain. He came to put purpose in your life. He came to stir up the gifts that are on the inside of you. And he came to give you joy that goes beyond anything you can possibly imagine. Now, wonder we call him Savior this morning. Can you say amen? amen. And, and so, for too many people, though, we're going to heaven but we're not realizing all that God has given us. They all end with a beautiful promise of what can be ours. I think too many ask the question, what does God require of me? 
when I think the real question is not what uh, do I have to do, but what more can I realize that God has already done and provided for me? There, there are all these these and theirs and theys that many of us haven't done yet. And there's a great potential for what God intended for every one of our lives. So let's look at this first one. And arguably, I believe this may be the most important one of the Beatitudes. In fact, I'm not sure you can even get to the other eight if you don't have this one first. And, and so Matthew 5, 3 says this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you can get all that God has for you when you realize you stand before God totally bankrupt, without nothing. The, there are two words for, in the Greek for the word poor. One word means you don't have enough. That's not the word that's used here. The word for poor means that you have nothing at all. That's the word that's being used here. That you're completely destitute without nothing. This passage is saying the happiest people are the ones that realize they're completely destitute. Let me say it like this. Blessed is the person who realizes they are completely destitute, utterly hopeless. One who realizes their absolute need for God. So I'm going to give you this in three other translations where they're saying the same thing just to show you how powerful this is. In the New Living Translation, it says, God blesses those who are poor and realizes their need for them, uh, for him, for their kingdom of heaven is theirs. God's word says, blessed are those who recognize they are spiritually helpless. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Now, those people... The, the last one is New Century, and it says, those people who know they have great spiritual needs are happy because the kingdom of heaven belongs to them, New Century version. Here's the problem. Most people, especially most people in America, don't realize how poor we actually are. If you have a lot, it's hard for you to recognize that you really don't have a lot. And if you've ever been to a place where you were able to obtain something or work for something or get something because you have all these options available to you, you don't really uh, understand how incredibly blessed we really are. I don't know if you know this, but probably 99.5% of the world would change places with you on your worst day. I wish I was preaching to somebody. On your worst day. So here we are, pretty abundant, pretty blessed, pretty self-satisfied in the greatest nation in all the world. But the problem with that is this. We will never depend on something we don't think we have need of. We will think we got it all. What does it really look like to be poor in spirit? It's for people to say, I can't get this on my own, and I'm not trying to judge you, but I think a lot of us think we actually can do it without God. I think we think we can attain that. And you know what I've come to realize about the missions trips that we go on? I thought we were going to these places to, to help them, but what really happens is they begin to help us because it gives a perspective on our life that we didn't have. These trips are getting harder and harder because this world is getting more dangerous and increasingly difficult. But one of my greatest wishes is for everybody that goes to TWC to be able to go on a missions trip where you don't have 10,000 choices of where you're going to eat today after church. Come on, somebody. But to a place that there's nothing and realize a great population of the earth lives that way. And you know what you will notice when you get to these places? They are way happier than you are. They are way more thankful than we are. There is nothing like pulling up with a van full of people to a place where the kids may have one set of clothes, a pair of shoes if they're lucky, with smile on their faces. And the whole reason their smile is a van full of people just showed up. Now we got new people to play with. You're not hearing what I'm telling you. They got that perspective. And you watch them worship. And you watch them play. And they have no worries. And they're happy. You know why? Because they know they are completely different. Destitute, and they have learned and, and leaned in on God and they have the true joy of the Lord. They are the ones that are blessed. So it's tough to teach this principle of how to be poor in spirit when we live in such a blessed nation. 
And here's my goal is, is I'm going to try the very best I have with, with the power and the authority of God's word to show you that, that you don't have as much as you think you have. And that you're actually completely destitute and helpless, needy. And when you get to that place before God, blessed you will be because you will get the kingdom of God. And you will realize the only thing you need comes from the one that has it. Are you hearing with me this morning? And so there's a verse in Revelation, and it's really kind of convicting to me, uh, that needs to be taught as well. Revelation is the only book of the New Testament that is really prophetic. John the disciple writes this from the Isle of Patmos, and, and he's telling us what end times are going to look like. The word revelation actually, uh, actually means apocalypse. It's the end of times. It's what uh, it's all going to look like. And here's my personal opinion. I don't think we're in end times. I think we're in the end of end times. I think Jesus could come back any minute. I wish I had half a church to come go with me. I think Jesus could come back any minute. I think he could come before we finish church today. And so I, I want you to, I want to encourage you to take a few minutes this week to re read Revelation chapter two and chapter three, but Jesus gives seven letters to seven churches, but in the very last one, the church of Laodicea, it goes like this, Revelation chapter three. He said, I know your deeds. Now, when I was writing this message, I'm going to read this to you like the Lord read it to me. Is that all right? He said, I know your needs or your, your deeds. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, Todd, I know you've got three campuses. I know that you started with seven people and you're where you're at today. I know that you're faithful to give to missions. I know that you give to other things uh, in our city. But I also know that you are neither cold nor hot. Now, this doesn't mean Christian or not Christian. It means to be one way or the other way, all the way. Come on, track with me. He said, I wish you were either one or, either one or the other. But so because you are lukewarm and lukewarmness comes from an attitude of thinking I'm okay, that I've got all of God that I need, that I don't need all of that to make it to, I don't need my mama's religion. I don't need that religion. I don't, and can I tell you, you don't need religion, but what you do need is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Religion's not going to get you to heaven. When you get to heaven, there will not be a church of Christ section and a Catholic section and a Baptist section. You'll be able to tell though where the church of Christ off. That'd be the most quiet one. And y'all know when we get to heaven, women won't be there for 30 minutes. Says there's going to be nothing but silence for 30 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to get shot in the parking lot today. Come on, somebody. Security. I need some security. So lukewarmness comes from thinking I got everything I need. He says, I wish you were neither hot, neither hot nor cold because I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich. We make statements like, I'm going to heaven, but, but I'm going to heaven. I've acquired wealth and I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I would love that inside every one of our hearts that we would realize just how wretched, poor, blind, and naked we really are without Jesus. And if you ever get to the place where you don't have anything except him and everything else that I still need is only going to come from him, but I cannot get them by myself, Bible says, then blessed you shall be and you will end up being the happiest person in the world. And, and let me give you four things that you don't have that you may think you have, but you don't have, just to just show you how Jesus supplies all four of these. Here's number one if you're a note taker. Without Jesus, I have to pay for my own sins. And I think people think they have a role in salvation. If I come to church, if I give, if I serve, if I say I'm sorry, I'm really gonna mess up your theology right here, but let me finish before you just walk out of the church, okay? Do you realize that you can ask for forgiveness of your sins and they will not be forgiven? Now, when I said that, people are like, ah, I'm going to a new church next Sunday. Stay with me. Why? Because it's not just forgiveness of sins that forgives your sins. Your sins are forgiven whenever they get paid for. God doesn't just show up and say, thank you. Thank you for trying hard, guys. Good job. Here's a participation trophy. I can't even get me started on that right there. Here's your little ribbon. 
good job. You, you, you did all of these things. You tried hard, so I forgive you. That's not how it plays out. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, for all have sinned. How many? All, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You must realize that somebody had to pay for what you and I did, and that payment isn't I'm sorry and, and, and doing things that are spiritual. Sin has a bill attached to it, and that bill is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Let me say it like this. Because of Jesus, I have the free gift of salvation, forgiveness, and eternal life. Isn't that a good place to say amen? <laughs> Tons of people think that God sends people he's mad at to hell. That's not it at all. Hell was not even made for believers. You go to, if you go to hell, you go to hell unwelcomed. You go to hell as a trespasser. Hell was made for Lucifer and his demons. But because of choices people are making, the word of God tells us that hell has enlarged itself, that it's actually getting bigger. But God doesn't send anybody there. Our choices send us there. Hell is a place where you can go and pay for your sins if you want to, or you can accept that they've already been paid for. Amen. Ephesians 2 says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. My God, catch that past tense. I used to be in the past. I used, that's who I was. That's not who I am anymore. I used to be messed up. That's not who I am anymore. I used to be an addict. That's not who I am anymore. I used to struggle with issues. That's not who I am anymore. The old has passed away and God has made all things new. Can you say amen? And he says, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world. All, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and allowing its desires and its thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But, oh, I love this, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, mercy is not getting what you really deserved, made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions or our sin. It is by grace. You know what grace is? Great is getting something you didn't deserve. It is by grace that you have been saved. You have to realize that you had a tab and you incurred a debt that had to be paid and Jesus stepped up and paid your bill. When you realize that, it changes the way you worship. When you realize that, it changes the way you praise him because you understand there was no way you could pay the bill except by the blood of Jesus Christ and that will make you love him and that will make you worship and that will make you adore him like there is nothing else. When that happens, nobody has to beg you to serve at church. Oh, it's getting quiet in here now. You serve because he first served you. When that happens, nobody has to beg you to bring your tithe. You well past the tithe. But when I talk about money, people get mad. They get all upset. Look here. All of you that don't pay your tithes, can you see the lights are still on? We can do it without you. Why? Because when it's God's will, he foots the bill. I'm not trying to get you to return your tithe to God's house because we need it. I'm trying to get you to return to God's house because your family needs the blessings of God. Once you catch that, and people say, well, you're just talking about money. Again, look around. We're making it without you. Well, you mean and hateful. I'm a lot of things. Mean and hateful ain't one. I'm chubby and slightly overweight is one. Balding is one. People say, you ain't balding, you bald. <laughs> and to that, I would say, y'all need Jesus, you hateful people. Look there. Here's the second thing. Without Jesus, I can only cope through my pain and, my person, and through my personhood. Like who you are is just who you are. And what happened to you just happened to you. And without Jesus, what will happen is we'll just self-medicate. And we'll put a Band-Aid on our wounds, learning how to cope and compensate and get over it. And you say you're over it, but you're still hating people. 
and you say you're over it, but you're still being hurt by people. But, you know, just cope with it. And, but pastor, you don't understand. My dad was like this, and my mom was like this, and, and we blame all of this, and this is just who, how God made me, and I can't help it. Can I tell you, that is a lie. You were made in the image of God. There is no faults in the image of God. You weren't made that way. You became that way. But you don't got to stay that way. Oh, I feel like rapping right now. But you don't got to stay that way. But that's not just how, what God has for you, for you to just go through life asking people all the time, will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? Just because you're hurting through the issue. Listen to me. God doesn't want you to cope. He wants you to be freed and he wants you to be healed. Jeremiah prophesied it. He's Jeremiah chapter 6. They offer superficial treatments for my people's mortal wounds. They give assurance of peace when there is no peace. Let me tell you who uh, Pastor Todd is without Jesus. Without Jesus, I'm a drug addicted, angry, hateful, mean spirited person trying all kinds of superficial treatments for my problems. But look what the Lord has done. He has healed me and he is healing me and making me more like him every day. That's who you become in Jesus. Because of Jesus, I have the power to be healed and be transformed. 1 Peter 2 says it this way. He himself bore our sins and his body on the Christ cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. I said you have been healed. For you were like sheep gone astray. See that? Without Jesus, we're just wandering around like Dora the Explorer. Come on, somebody. You're just trying to get through here. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and the overseers of your souls. I don't know if that means anything to you, but when my dad passed away years ago, I, I knew my heart could break, but I didn't know my soul could break. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Soul's a whole nother level when you, you don't know how to get through it. But I'm so glad I've never seen this scripture before. I'm sure I've read it, but it never got highlighted until I did this series. Do you know that your soul can be overseen? That your soul can be healed by the power of God? That God doesn't want you to manage your pain? And he doesn't want you to manage your pain. He wants to heal your pain and transform you into a completely different person. Then that's available here today. That's here today. God wants to heal those that are going through torment. Those of you that are having panic attacks. Those of you that got fear and worry and lack of sleep. Your stress levels are at an all time higher than ever. And I decree and declare by the name of Jesus that all of that has to end today. And some people will say, but Pastor Todd, there is no peace. But today there is peace because God did not come to band-aid you. He came to heal you in Jesus' name. And not just to heal you, but to transform you. You don't got to stay the way you are. You can be transformed this morning by the power of God. That ought to fire you up right there. Galatians chapter 5. This is what happens when we get transformed. But the fruit of the Spirit. There's love, joy, peace, kindness. Good to see how I left out patience right there. <laughs> patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Well, Pastor Todd, that's hard for me to wrap my mind around. Well, that's because you're spending too much time with your own thoughts and the wrong people. You can produce every one of those attributes by the power of the cross. You don't have to be angry, sir. You don't have to, anger's not the only emotion you can show. That's a lie from hell. If you can show that emotion, you can show all the other emotions. I want to help somebody today. But you will only get these things when you realize that you don't have it. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for you will get the kingdom of God. Here's number three. Without Jesus, I'm trying to find or create my own life. The number one question, I've been doing this for 33 years. The number one question I get asked all the time. Hey, what, what's my life supposed to be about? What should I be doing? What do you think that looks like? I get asked all the time. Pastor Shane, our staff, we get texts, emails all the time. Do you know that the Bible says that he has set eternity into your heart? That he will set a sense of purpose without you being able to find, to draw you to himself? Like you'll just be out trying to find it and you can't find it unless you come back to him? 
Jeremiah tells us this. Let me show you the real faith. A lot of you probably got this tattooed on your arm somewhere or on your body somewhere. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans. Can I just stop right there and say, <laughs> that means if you're looking for plans anywhere else for him, you're never going to find them? And isn't that crazy that he just said, I know the plans. And we're like, hey, do you know what do you think I ought to be doing? Well, why don't you go talk to the one that knows the plans? Eh, that sounds all right, but you know. What do you think we should be doing? How about let's go to the one that knows the plans? Huh? We're, we're like West Texas people, like we, we're, we're hard-headed, right? We don't even get directions the right way. <laughs> right? We don't. I love, I'm, I'm born and bred, 806, but we don't give directions. Right? You go down yonder a little bit, and you're going to see this red rooster out in their front yard. Make a left of that red rooster, and it's going to jag just a little bit. You're going to be on the Cleachy Road, but don't worry. Your car will be all right. You're going to be, go down yonder a little bit further and go to the right. When you go to the right, you'll probably see a cow out there in the pasture, and at that cow, you won't turn right. And they're like, well, what if the cow ain't there? Well, you're still going to turn right. It doesn't matter if the cow's there or not. You got to <laughs> Right? How long is it going to take me to get there? Nobody ever says mile. About three and a half hours. <laughs> How many miles is three and a half hours? Nobody knows. But God knows because he's got plans. Come on, for I have plans. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Listen, it's not just something he, he, he man, I, I think I got one. He said, I declare I've got the plan. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody. If you've been wondering what the plan is for your life, God says, I have got the plan, and my plan is to prosper you and not to harm you. My plan is to give you hope and to give you a future in Jesus' name. Well, what if I've been locked up? You still got a hope in a future. What if I got a felony record? You still have a hope in a future. What if I had an abortion? You still got a hope in a future. What if I've been messed up many times? You still have a hope in a future. The world may have got some of you, but it did not get all of you. The book of Amos says, if all God has left is a piece of sheep ear and a leg bone, he'll redeem it. What are you telling me? God can take an ear and a leg and put a sheep back together. The world may have got some of you, but it did not get all of you. And whatever is left, God has a plan to prosper you in Jesus' name. And it don't matter who likes it. I don't like that you get prospered. Don't go tell God. Go fight with him. I just read his word and I trusted it. I'm just walking out his word. Well, I'm on probation. I'm walking out his word. I'm not even off paper yet. I'm still walking out his word. I got my ankle bracelet on right now. I'm still walking out his word. In fact, if you got an ankle bracelet on, we want you taking up offering. Ain't nobody going to tell you no. I'm just teasing. <laughs> no, I'm not. Here we go. <laughs> Listen, the world comes along and says, did you know that you evolved from nothing to this? That you went from goo to the zoo? That's what they're trying to teach us in school. You go from goo to the zoo to where you are now. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. In fact, to me, it takes more faith to believe that I went from the goo to the zoo than to blend that God's got a plan for my life. But because of Jesus, I have the ability to know who I am and what my life is all about. Don't just settle for salvation. Please lean into this. Don't just settle for salvation. Praise God you're going to heaven, but you could go to heaven healed, transformed, and changed and know the purpose for your life. You hear what I'm telling you? Don't just make heaven. Get, go, go to heaven healed. Well, when I get to heaven, I'll be healed. But won't you be miserable while you walk this world unhealed? Abundant living's for now. I don't need abundant living in heaven. Nobody's going to be in heaven like, anybody got Advil? <laughs> hey, man, I got sinus infection. Anybody got... <sniffs> My leg hurt. Nobody's going to be walking around talking about aches and pains. You'll be whole. Amen. So being healed on this side is where it really matters because there we'll be whole. We won't even be healed. We'll be whole. Catch me on that. I hope you're tracking with me. Why I go through this earth putting up with all the stuff we don't have to put up with when God says we can be healed. 
Paul is in Athens, and he's teaching to a bunch of people who are worshiping God. And in my opinion, I know you're not supposed to say things like in church, but I'm going to say, these are the dumbest, stupid people I've ever seen in the Bible. And I know your kids are sitting there going, man, you told us not to say stupid. These people are stupid. There, there's, no other, there's no other answer for it. Like, I'm going to show you how. He's, they're worshiping a God, and the name of the God is unknown God. Who you worship? I don't know. How long y'all going to be here? No one knows. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. How are you going to worship you don't even know the name of it? Stay with me. And Paul's writing to these people, and this is how he appealed to them in Acts chapter 17. Don't ever forget this scripture I'm about to read to you. Acts 17, 26, from one man, he made all the nations. So if you're racist, that scripture right there just made you really, really mad. (laughs) White folk, black folk, brown folk, yellow folk, all folk came from one man. That means if you put a needle on my arm and a needle on somebody else's arm and we got the same blood type, we can save one another's life. Y'all not hear what I'm telling you. We got to get past this stupid stuff. We got to get past it. I know white people, look here. I know it's unfair. Because black folks win in at sports that really matter. <laughs> white people, we win in at hockey and swimming. <laughs> I sit there all the time and be like, there you go. You're doing the truth. White people, we got barbecue a little bit. Mexican people got the best food on the planet known to God. <laughs> Mexican food's gonna be heaven. Lord's Supper's gonna have Mexican food and ribs. <laughs> and let me tell you, and purple Kool Aid. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Not great. Purple or red. And the good thing about it, we ain't gonna get fat. Hi! Hey! <laughs> and you can put as many cups of sugar in that Kool Aid as you want. Come on, somebody! Y'all can tell I was raised on the east side, right? Mm. Let, them, let them throw some greens up there. See, Todd, Pastor Todd don't run around to heaven, right? <laughs> From one man, he made all the nations. Why? That they should inhabit the whole earth. Watch this scripture. This is where it gets really important. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did that so they would seek him. Let me stop right there. What he just said is you don't go to church where you go to church by accident. What he just said is you don't live where you live by accident. Let me go over here. What he just said is you don't work where you work by accident. Your kids don't go to school where they go to school by accident. They are sent into that school to change the school, not for the school to change them. So while you pray in protection, don't just pray protection. Pray the mission and the promise and the ministry that God has for them when you drop them off at the school. Because they're not there by accident. Are you hearing me? That's what the scripture just... And you could have been born at any time and God put you on this earth right now for such a time as this. There's only one person that I goes to church at the worship center that I've met personally that's born out of time. And that's Joey Sanchez. Joey, Joey should have been on gun smoke. Little house on the prairie. Give Joey a mule in a wagon. We, he won't even go home to Crystal no more. He'd be like, Yum! He, he's an old timer, right? I, I never met anybody like Joey. Even when you talk to Joey, he's just like, yeah, we're going to go plant a crop out there. And I said, aren't you a painter? But I got dreams, Pastor. <laughs> I got dreams of planting a crop one day. Like Michael Landon. I said, brother, you've been touched by an angel, and I think it's dust. Anyway, so... <laughs> He says, you was appointed by times in history and the boundaries. Watch this. God did this so you would seek him. Don't miss it. Let me say it like this. God did it so you would realize how spiritually poor you are. And perhaps reach out for him and find him. This is part I love. Though he is not far from any one of us. Isn't that great news? For in him we live and move and have our being. You will never live and you will never move and you will never have true life or or the being that God intends you to be if you try to figure it all out by yourself. You gotta come to him. Here's the last one. Without Jesus, I'm living my life for joys that will fade away. Buddy Holly wrote a song about that. 
Y'all don't know who Buddy Holly is? Y'all from Lubbock and don't know who Buddy Holly is? Y'all go find a new church right now. <laughs> Buddy Holly wrote a song, that Fade Away. You need to listen to the song. Good song. Word of love, not fade away. Boom, 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 boom. Nobody? I bet if I played some Selena up in this church, y'all know exactly who that is. <laughs> See, right? Oh, yeah, I know you, Selena. <laughs> Without Jesus, <laughs> I'm living my... <laughs> Help me, Lord. I need to be. I need to behave. Pray for your pastor. So, what's saying? Your joys will be temporary. Now, there's a word called anhedonia. It's spelled A N H E D O N I A. It's your S A T word for the day. It's the only big word I got. Anhedonia. And you know what it means? It means you no longer have the ability to experience joy or pleasure from things that used to bring you joy or pleasure. It's actually one of the first symptoms of depression. But you don't have to live that way. First Peter says, praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and not into an inheritance. In other words, he's saying not just salvation that can never perish, can never spoil, and that can never fade. Do you know what an inheritance is? What your purpose is? Do you know what your purpose and inheritance is? It's to impact the lives of people around you. How do you know? Psalms chapter 2 says, ask me, and I will give you people and nations as your inheritance. I maintain that the happiest people on the planet are people who are impacting other people's lives for eternity. My dad, if he were alive, would be so mad about the statement I'm about to make. I've been preaching for 33 years. I've been pastoring for 32 of those years. I've been a lead pastor for 27 of those years. And I haven't went to work in 33 years. My dad would be so bad. <laughs> you better get a job. You need a job. Because I took his advice and I sought the Lord about what I should do. And when you do what you love, you'll never consider it work. I love doing life with the people of TWC. I genuinely love being your pastor. If you don't know that, you're crazy. I love meeting you out in the foyer. I love catching up with you in the parking lot. I like talking to our youth about my shoe game and how they wish they had one like mine. I dumbed it down today, though. Do I look like Pat Mahomes? Shoes don't do it? All right, then. So my Jordans don't make me jump higher either? I got zero hope. Listen, when you find that thing you were made to do, your whole perspective of life will change. It, it, it'll just, sh I can't explain it to you until you experience it. When you experience, you're like, wow, what was I waiting on? And if you don't find that thing without it, you're poor. Every other joy you chase can be vacations, houses, food, football games. I do all of those things. There's nothing wrong with those things, but here's what I know. It'll all fade away. How many of you go on vacation when you're like, man, I wish we had one more day. Gosh, I can't believe it's come to the end of the week. Unless it's summer and your kids are with you. You're like, when school start? <laughs> I bet during COVID, right after COVID, them teachers didn't have to ask for no school supplies, did they? You're like, here's your extra glue. Here's your napkins. I got you $575 worth of Starbucks, whatever you need. Don't send them back to our house. Jeez. I'm not prepared to, to do that. I can parent them, but I cannot teach them. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Listen, those things will fade away. Here's the last statement I want to make. Because of Jesus, I can have the joy of living a life that glorifies God and impacts others. That's the whole reason I do what I do. John 15 says it this way. This is to my Father's glory. That you, it's everybody here, everybody online, everybody at South, everybody at Brownfield that's listening and in our overflow. That you bear much fruit. Why? Why? Because you show yourselves to be his disciples when you do that. In other words, when you bear fruit, you look like Jesus. He said, I've told you this so that you, watch this, my joy may be in you. When you do what I did, you're going to have the same joy that I had. And guess what? Your joy may be complete. You will never be happy with your life until you're impacting the life of somebody else. 
So here's the big idea behind the first beatitude. You want to bring it down to one thing. It's simply this. Jesus, I need you. I don't need you plus this. I need you. I need you. Well, Pastor Todd, I, man, I, I'm the provider for my home. No, you're not. No, you're not, sir. You're picking up a burden you were never meant to carry. That may be why you're stressed out because you're trying to think you're the provider and you're not. Well, I'm the one that goes to work and I put in 50 or 60 hours. Okay, I hear you. Not discrediting your work ethic. I'm just asking, how much effort did you put in last night for your heart to beat? I did none. My CPAP, don't it? <laughs> Couldn't even hear. <laughs> Trish didn't even kink my hose. Come on, somebody. That, that, that's all the effort I put out. And my heart went up and down because it wasn't my time to meet the Lord. And if you went to work and you put 50 or 60 hours in, who do you think empowered you to do that? It was the Lord. You hear it? It's not you. It's the Lord. You ever thought, sometimes blessings don't come back financially. We're always looking for blessing. How about everybody else at the daycare got strep throat, but your baby didn't get strep throat? You don't know how to explain it. It just happened. 10 out of 13 kids got strep throat, but you're not, your kid's not one of them. Everybody else got laid off. Somehow you kept your job some way. Some, you think that's a coincidence or do you think it's God's provision? Are you, are you tracking with me this morning? Sometimes the greatest prayer, I think we're always trying to find the right words. And, and we want to be deep and we want to just, we really want to go in it so our prayers are heard. Can I just tell you one of the most powerful prayers you'll ever pray is, Jesus, help. Help. I need help. What do you need? I don't know. I just know I need help. I don't know. I know I cried myself to sleep and I don't know what the tears mean, but I'm so glad that the Bible tells me that you have captured every tear in the bottle and that we have a God that speaks teardrop. You're not hearing what I, He speaks frog. He speaks fly. He speaks teardrop. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? There's not been one tear you've cried that God hasn't picked out. And you know, when you don't know how to put the words, your tears are crying out, help! And God is there to meet you. So for some of us today, the greatest thing we could pray is just, I need help. I thought that I had joy, but I find out that I'm only really happy when happenings are right. I thought that I had joy, but I really realize I only have joy when my circumstances are right. Here's the difference between joy and happiness, and I'll shut my mouth. Let's see you get up in the morning. You know what pastor means when he's going to shut his mouth? Nothing. Um, you get up in the morning, you walk out, you're ready to go to work, and you go out and you got a flat tire on your car. And man, you're like, oh, this is all I needed. I'm already running behind. How oh, no. I change this stupid tire and you're kicking the tire like it's gonna grind air by kicking it. It's gonna air up by kicking it and cursing at it. Come on, somebody. I'm gonna... <laughs> Nobody in here but your friends that don't go to church. Come on. And you're dueling all this. That's, that's based on happiness. Joy is you get up the same morning, you go out, you got the same flat, and you're like, whew, there must have been a wreck down the road that God was trying to keep me out of, and I thank God that I didn't, I didn't get that. And so while I'm changing this tire, rather than complaining, I'm going to praise him for protecting me and watching over me. When I, didn't, when I didn't even know I needed protection, he was protecting me. That's the difference between joy and happiness. It's not based on circumstances. It's based on a position with Jesus. And it can't come from anywhere else. If it could come from a 12-pack, you would have already found it. Lord knows we've drank enough of them. I know, again, nobody at this service, but your friends that didn't choose to come today, okay? If it came in a dime bag, we'd already found it. If it was in the back seat of a car, we'd already found it. Come on, talk to me. If it was in the eight ball, we would already found it. The reason we didn't find it, listen, no, here's what made me so mad when I was a drug addict. I was spending money on stuff I couldn't even afford and wake up broker than I was. How, I mean, just dumb. Then I had to go break into somebody's house to take their stuff to provide for my stuff. Oh, make no mistake about it. If you're a drug addict, you're a thief and a liar. 100%. That's who I used to be, though. I've not done any of those things in 34 years. 
And when I got delivered, I got delivered in a moment, in an, three years cocaine addict, in a moment. In a moment, no, no rehab, no withdrawals. Isaiah chapter 6 is what brought me back to the Lord. Verses 1 through 6. Go read it and see if it don't change your whole perspective. Isaiah gets right with the Lord, and then he hears God talking. Like, you could hear God for yourself. I didn't think I could hear God for myself. I thought I needed a priest or a pastor or a prophet. No, 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 no. You can hear God for yourself. If you're a sheep, you hear the shepherd. Don't let nobody tell you you can't hear for God. You can hear from God if you're a sheep. All right? And, and this guy that just got right with God, he didn't go to growth track. He's not even gone to freedom. He's not even been to a 12 track, 12 program steps. Huh? He hears God from himself and God says, who's going to go? And this guy that just got right, he said, I got a dirty mouth and all my friends got a dirty mouth. He said, well, I guess I'll go. I ain't doing nothing right now. I ain't got no more friends. And God says, go. And I was like, God, if that's who you are, if I could lay my addiction down and you could forgive it like that and put me to work, I'll chase you the rest of my life. Not one withdrawal, not one reho program, and I walked out and I've been preaching the gospel of Jesus ever since. But from 18 to right 21, that's all I did. But there's hope for you and there's a promise for you. What you've done is not who you are. People say, Pod, don't you worry what people think? No, they, you can think what you think. The, the person you have bad feelings about, I buried him. You're going to have to go to the cemetery to talk to O Todd. You're not going to be able to find him. I put him where Dexter put him. Come on, somebody. I, I killed that sucker. I don't want him ever coming back. I don't hang a wreath. There's no headstone for O Todd. I just want him to bed. I don't want him to be found. I just know that God made all things new, and that's what's on the table today is, Jesus, I need you. <laughs> Blessed are those that poor are poor in spirit. Are you with me this morning? Want every head bowed at all of our campuses. I want our altar workers to move as fast as they can. Blessed are the poor in the spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The kingdom of heaven is theirs. You're here this morning, and you, you don't even know what all you need. Nobody's looking around. It's nobody's business. You can't fix it. Only God can. Maybe you just raise your hand and say, Pastor Todd, I need Jesus to help me today. If that's you, can I see your hand? That's all you can put to work. I just need help. Yeah, I see him. Once you raise him, you can put him down. Whether you come up here and let me pray for you or not, you'll at least acknowledge you know that God's talking to you today. Can I see your hand? Yes, thank you for your honesty. Here's what I want to tell you, those who just raised your hand. Don't dismiss that moment. Don't dismiss it. You've got to come forward. You don't. You can do it right there at your seat. You can get right. How many are here and you say, Pastor, I just need some prayer this morning. I need somebody to put some courage in me before I leave this place. If that's you, can I see your hand? All right. In just a moment, our worship team is going to play. Once you raise it, you can put it down. They're going to play this song. And if you raised your hand or if you need prayer for anything, never go to church and need prayer and leave here without it. We don't want to mock you. We don't want to make fun of you. We want to put courage on the inside because at TWC, we don't do life alone. If you want prayer, the altars are open. I'm going to turn this back over to our South Campus and our Brownfield Campus.